Good afternoon, and thanks for tuning in to learn more about the AIDS Free Pittsburgh Initiative. My name is Julia Oak, and I serve as the AIDS Free Pittsburgh Project Manager at the Jewish Healthcare Foundation in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm joined today by my colleagues Stuart Fisk with the AHN Center for Inclusion Health and Dr. Deborah McMahon with the UPMC Center for Care of Infectious Diseases. Our learning objectives for this session are to review the AIDS-Free Pittsburgh strategic plan and outcomes, describe the elements of a collective impact model and end of the epidemic, and describe the adaptation of rapid linkage to care in clinical settings. To start off, I'll provide an overview of the initiative and then my colleagues will speak more specifically to the successes and challenges that their Ryan White clinics have experienced during the project. We'll save some time at the end for you to ask questions about starting a Getting to Zero initiative in your community. First, I'd like to share the history of our local Ending the Epidemic movement and then discuss the nuts and bolts of the AIDS Free Pittsburgh project as well as some of our outcomes to date. Allegheny County has historically been second after Philadelphia in terms of new HIV cases and people living with HIV in Pennsylvania. Back in 2015, a number of local healthcare leaders were inspired by other getting to zero efforts in New York State, Washington State, and San Francisco to start a similar effort in Allegheny County. The original thought was that AIDS, AIDS Free Pittsburgh could be a model for other jurisdictions that may not be eligible for Ryan White Part A, but still wanting to do their part to end the epidemic. The founding members spent most of 2015 planning collective goals and strategies inviting key stakeholders and seeking operational funding from our local health systems. Pittsburgh is often called a city of eds and meds, so we were able to build key partnerships with two local health systems, the Allegheny County Health Department, the University of Pittsburgh, and a number of community-based organizations to launch the project. We actually use the fact that two of these large health systems were in competition with each other in order to leverage a joint 1.5 million funding pledge over the first five years of the project. It was really impactful to have both leaders from both health systems actually stand together with local government leaders on World AIDS Day of 2015 to launch the project. Dedicated Backbone staff were then hired and began in January of 2016. AIDS Free Pittsburgh set out to reduce new HIV cases by 75% and achieve zero new AIDS cases by the end of the year 2020, this year. To achieve this, the group decided to focus on routinizing HIV screening, facilitating immediate linkage to care for new diagnoses, aim for 95% viral load suppression, support strategies for HIV prevention among communities at high risk, and build capacity for PrEP and PEP service delivery. The group chose to use a collective impact model with the Jewish Healthcare Foundation serving as the backbone organization for the project. The foundation was selected because of their existing HIV AIDS department that also serves as the fiscal agent for funding from the Ryan White Part B, State 656, and HUD HAPWA in the 11 county southwestern PA region, as well as for the statewide minority AIDS initiative. AIDS Free Pittsburgh is led by an advisory group comprised of approximately 20 and individual and organizational members, as well as subcommittees that are tasked with implementing various pieces of the strategic plan. Additionally, AIDS Free Pittsburgh has established letters of support with other organizations in the community, demonstrating their collective commitments to ending the epidemic. So far, We've seen some promising outcomes, including a 39% decrease in new HIV cases and a 43% decrease in new AIDS cases from 2015 to 2018. As an update, we recently received preliminary 2019 epi data from the state, which has indicated a slight increase from 2018 to 2019. So we will be reevaluating what this means for the latter half of the project. I will also note that one of our key challenges at the beginning of the project was securing the baseline data that we needed in a timely manner. It did take us a couple of years to establish data sharing agreements with local health plans and labs in order to get this timely outcome data. Thanks to strong relationships, we were able to secure this data on an in-kind basis, receiving reports from our partners every six months. 
When it comes to HIV prevention, we have seen a significant increase in community awareness of PrEP and PrEP uptake, according to local PrEP surveys and health plan claims data. We've also seen promising results in expanding routine HIV screening in medical settings through the Gilead Focus Project. Stuart and Dr. McMahon will speak more to the logistics of how this has worked in their respective health systems. Last but not least, we've observed an increase in both linkage to care and viral load suppression. We believe this is likely due to the adaptation of rapid linkage to care protocols in several HIV care clinics. With that, I'll pass the next section of the presentation over to Stuart Fisk, Director of the Center for Inclusion Health. Thank you, Julia. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, I wanna talk um, kind of at a higher level about our Focus HIV screening program um, that we've set up both in the emergency departments and some primary care pilot settings, as well as our rapid linkage to antiretroviral treatment. Um, we were initially trained by the San Francisco Health Department on how to do rapid linkage to care, um, and we really appreciated their, um, their wisdom in helping us set this program up. So, next slide. So the Center for Inclusion Health um, is a large kind of entity within uh, the Medicine Institute at Allegheny Health Network and within the Center for Inclusion Health sits the Positive Health Clinic, which is our Ryan White Part C funded clinic and we serve about a thousand HIV patients in that clinic. So the center um, was awarded a grant from Gilead Sciences um, called the FOCUS, which stands for Frontline of Communities in the United States Project to implement routinized HIV and hepatitis C screening in clinical settings. And we're currently in year three of that grant. The goals of the FOCUS project, for those of you that are not familiar with it, is the integration of routine HIV and hepatitis C testing into the normal clinical workflow, the effective linkage to care and follow-up patients for who test positive for HIV and hepatitis C, and the establishment of an organization-wide commitment to implement routine testing and linkage to care for both HIV and hepatitis C. We initially chose um, two primary care clinics as pilot sites for our primary care arm, and um, we started in one emergency department at Allegheny General Hospital, which is a large urban trauma center uh, in Pittsburgh, and we recently expanded that to a second urban hospital, West Penn Hospital, also in the urban setting in Pittsburgh. Um, next slide. So from 2017 to 19, um, the FOCUS program conducted over 11,000 HIV tests across our testing sites, um, identifying a total of 33 cases of HIV, which included 24 new HIV diagnoses. 27 of the cases were identified in the emergency department and six cases were identified in our primary care clinics. All the testing in these uh, sites were done using blood draws. Um, which required phlebotomy and used the HIV antigen antibody fourth generation with a reflex and multi spot, multi -spot confirmation so that we didn't have to do follow up uh, lab work to get confirmatory tests um, for, uh, for HIV. And we did a reflex to PCR for the hepatitis C tests. Um, so, really significant improvements in routine screening, as you can see from 400 tests in the first quarter to um, close to 2,000 tests um, in Q3 of 2019. Next slide. So in the emergency departments, we set up um, eligibility for screening through EPIC, um, <clears throat> through a best practice alert that is built into the EPIC triage narrator flow. Um, and the EPIC will screen people and decide if they're eligible for HIV screening using the CDC guidelines, so age of 13 to 64 years old. Um, they have not, they should not have had a test in our system for the past 12 months, and they don't already have an HIV diagnosis. We tried a lot of different, we tried more complex screening algorithms, um, but they were very difficult to operationalize. So this is the simplest and most effective um, eligibility uh, criteria that we could come up with that, that allowed us to effectively screen folks. So we also made screening in the emergency departments a nurse-driven protocol. This was based on the advice from the, actually from the provider leadership in the emergency rooms who said that if we leave it up to the providers, it's probably not gonna happen. So the best practice alert, as I said, is built into the triage um, 
narrator. So when a patient comes into the emergency department, they're seen by a triage nurse, they're determined to be eligible for screening for either HIV or hepatitis C. They are offered testing. They're given a simple handout with the uh, needed information about testing and the opportunity to ask questions. Um, it is an opt-out model. And when they document, when they uh, give informed consent or opt, um, decide not to opt out, uh, their, their verbal agreement is documented in the record and that's according to Pennsylvania state law. So if they don't decline screening, the triage nurse places the order for the labs and the HIV or hepatitis C screening is drawn with other blood work um, once they're in the emergency department. There are no charges for uninsured patients. Those bills are covered by the, by the program, so the patient never gets a bill for either of those tests if they're uninsured or underinsured. And then the provider just signs off on the orders in EPIC on the back end at some point. Um, so this is really a nurse-driven process. Uh, providers don't need to be involved at all. All of the HIV positive patients are referred directly to the positive health clinic through the rapid ART line, which is um, picked up immediately when it rings in the clinic by a trained social worker. Next slide. So I wanted to just uh, give you a case study of why um, this program is important and why do it in emergency departments. Um, so this is a this is a case study about a woman named Emma. We call it Emma. It's not her real name. She's a cisgender heterosexual female in her 30s. She was engaged in both primary care and OBGYN care for many years prior to uh, being screened in the emergency department. And in fact, she was seen by both uh, her primary care and OBGYN in 2019 and was not offered HIV screening at either visit. She had a, preg a previous pregnancy that she was tested for HIV and was non-reactive at the time. When she presented to the emergency department in 2019 with an orthopedic injury, um, she was found to be eligible. She was consented and agreed to be tested. She was admitted to the hospital uh, for observation and routine. the routine blood work that we did came back, confirmed um, HIV positivity, and also a CD4 count was done showing um, an extremely low CD4 count and so a concurrent new AIDS diagnosis. She was linked to um, the Positive Health Clinic via the Rapid ART program. She was seen within five days of her diagnosis of HIV, started on antiretroviral therapy and remains engaged in care and virologically suppressed. Um, so this is really, a this is unfortunately a, a too typical case study where um, we are finding new diagnoses of HIV. Um, however, they're also being diagnosed with AIDS at the same time. Next slide. So looking at the screenings in primary care, different challenges in primary care. Um, so, but since um, we started the program in 2016 in the resident primary care clinic here at Allegheny General, um, we screened over 2,000 patients for HIV. That's in a clinic of about 5,000 patients. Um, we've identified six new um, persons living with HIV, and all six were successfully linked to treatment in the Positive Health Clinic. Um, the, the way that the workflow works in primary care is that uh, the screenings are available in EPIC's health maintenance tool. Um, and in this clinic, health coaches who are medical assistants who have been trained up a little bit um, are prepping the, the charts for the resident uh, provider uh, but prior to the patient coming into the visit. If they see that they're eligible for HIV or hepatitis C screening, they drop the, they order the tests and they're put in a pending queue um, for, or, for actual ordering and signature by the provider. Um, it is a provider-driven protocol and it is an opt-in protocol. And so those are two things that we're really trying to, to figure out how to work with because we really want a true opt-out protocol. Medical assistants can't legally get verbal consent in Pennsylvania, and there's not enough nurses to see every patient that needs consenting, so we really have to turn that over to the providers. Um, part of the problem is that there's a big turnover of both residents and um, staff in the resident clinic, which leads to a constant need for training and retraining. We're looking at um, actually switching a little bit. Um, one of the problems also is that um, Phlebotomy uh, has been a problem because it's not been available routinely in the clinic itself. They have to go to a lab upstairs and very often people are getting their, their lab orders and just walking out. And that's not just for their HIV and hepatitis C, it's also for their lipid panels and all their other stuff. There's just not a good uh, adherence to getting labs done. 
So we're looking at a written consent for point of care testing that's actually would be performed by the residents in the clinic and then really kind of switching over to an opt-out script. Next slide. So the rapid project um, has um, wanted to switch over to the rapid project. Um, so the rapid antiretroviral project, as I said, is based on training done by the San Francisco Department of Health about their uh, program in San Francisco. It's been highly effective. Um, from March of 2017 to May of 2019, our data, um, we're, we're currently catching up on our data collection. 53 patients were enrolled during that period of time and referred to the rapid program. 18 or 34 percent of the patients had an AIDS diagnosis at the time of intake, which is consistent with a lot of data that we've seen for many years of concurrent diagnosis of HIV and AIDS. So late stage diagnosis due largely to the lack of routine HIV testing. At the time of their first medical visit, which is often the same day that they're diagnosed or certainly within a few days, um, they're given a seven day supply of antiretroviral therapy regardless of insurance. They get a one to four day follow up call with each patient. Uh, from the from one of the, the medical team after the visit. And in that interim uh, period, we're working on insurance coverage, um, getting resistance testing followed up on, um, looking at other medical conditions and social determinants of health. Under this program, the average time to viral load suppression has been uh, dropped from 90 days to uh, 48.5 days to, to virologic suppression, which is really great. Um, we've also seen really good retention in care for people engaged in this program. Um, after year one of the program, 100% of those retained in care, which were about 31 of the patients, remained virologically suppressed at less than 200 copies. Next slide. We've had to do a lot of education um, to make sure that providers know about the RAPID program. Um, We've done this largely through training, both online and in-person training with over 400 primary care providers in our health system, as well as um, we've reached a lot of community providers through our Mid-Atlantic AIDS Education Training Center. We do quality improvement. Um, we do data analytics on all the people in the program. We also do a lot of calling back referring providers and closing the loop on the referrals and making sure that um, their primary care providers, if they retain those providers, are getting information about the patient. And um, we just we realized that we really needed a way for a rapid and simple referral to the positive health clinic. So we built that into Epic um, that not only allows an immediate referral to happen, but also gives the phone number to the rapid lines so the provider or the patient can call that line and engage in care the same day. Next slide. This is just a look at some of the data. Um, as you can see, as I said, uh, the median days from clinical identification of a case to viral virologic suppression. And the pre-rapid program time was 90 days, and we've cut that down to 48.5 days through May of 2019. And I believe we've probably cut it down more significantly since that time. Next slide. Um, looking at the 53 people that were in the rapid project, um, most are young between the ages of 20 and 39. Um, 75 percent are male and 57 percent were african-american which shows that we're really reaching the target demographics that we need to reach next slide so some of the challenges with the rapid program there have been a number um, but the the question of late stage diagnosis meaning uh, people were diagnosed with hiv um, and aids concurrently when we do look backs at records. Um, we've seen that in many of these cases, people have had a primary care provider for sometimes up to 20 years. And when you look at the medical record, what you see is they've had access to information about risk and red flags for HIV infection and have not tested for HIV. Often when they, people are uh, diagnosed with HIV, um, they're not referred in a timely manner, and very often the patient is made responsible for research and referral to HIV care on their own, which leads uh, to people being lost to care. We are also having to manage a lot of complex comorbid conditions, not just opportunistic infections often, but also diabetes and cardiovascular disease, mental health and substance use problems, um, which can make rapid initiation a challenge. Um, we have seen a decline in, in testing given the COVID pandemic over the last six months. Um, however, we are beginning to see those numbers rise again, which is good. Um, and then the change in engagement with new patients uh, due to the pandemic, because we've switched a lot to um, avoiding face-to-face -face visits and doing telephonic and virtual care. 
We are bringing newly diagnosed patients into the clinic using um, um, kind of standard prevention techniques and um, so we do that when we can, um, but it has made it more challenging. And then the last thing I would just mention is that we, you know, there are new clinical trials uh, that we have access to and are utilizing in our clinic for treatment naive patients. Um, and enrollment in a clinical trial can often take time, which actually is delaying that rapid initiation. Um, we don't think that the answer is to not offer new drug, um, but we need to kind of figure out how to, how to integrate new clinical research trial enrollment into our rapid program. So that's it. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. McMahon from UPMC. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stuart. My discussion with regard to H3 Pittsburgh will center on our focus initiative with inpatients, our efforts to increase access to PrEP and rapid, our rapid linkage to care implementation. Next slide, please. At UPMC, we rolled out the focus screening program on the medical inpatient units in contrast to West, uh, HN's uh, outpatient settings. The emergency room leadership at UPMC Presby declined to participate given the absolutely high volume of patients seen there, the acuity of care delivered because we're a major trauma and referral center, and the staffing levels they faced. The patients are approached on the inpatient setting by a clinician who's on the admitting team and asked if they consent to HIV and hep C screening, presenting the request as part of our routine standard of care. It required a major build in the electronic medical record with appropriate alerts. In Pennsylvania, as Stuart mentioned, documented oral consent is required. Next slide. The HIV alert appears when the clinician enters the admission orders. These are the factors that are listed here on this slide that we included as part of, as the IT team built this, the alerts into our Cerner electronic medical record. It took months to accomplish this, but it was, it was done eventually. Next slide. As of several months ago, uh, 14 individuals were newly diagnosed or identified with HIV, three of whom were women. All were linked to HIV care in a timely manner in our clinic. Two individuals had been previously diagnosed with HIV elsewhere, but they failed to disclose that information as part of their medical history to the admitting team. We continue to assess barriers and missed opportunities for testing and identify reasons why some patients are not asked about testing. We plan to readdress testing in the emergency room setting once the COVID-19 pandemic subsides. Next slide, please. Enhancing access to PrEP services has been a cornerstone of our collective efforts to end the epidemic. We face several challenges, including pervasive stigma and how to provide access for at-risk youth less than 18 years of age. To mitigate stigma, we have worked to engage the community and elicit their feedback regarding their experiences with PrEP. We're also re promoting research on microaggressions experienced by patients in the community and in healthcare settings. As Julia mentioned, we have working groups and the PrEP working group launched a community messaging campaign to get out the message to at-risk groups. We are also working with a law school at Pitt and our state HIV planning group to develop language to be incorporated into current Pennsylvania statutes to protect patients and providers. Next slide, please. Additional approaches to enhance access to PrEP are needed. In our clinic, patients can now be scheduled to see a provider five days a week, including urgent care or same day appointments for PrEP services. Now, more recently, during the COVID-19 stay at home orders, we greatly expanded our telehealth services uh, for PrEP care. We are working with the AETC to educate primary care providers and encourage the prescription of PrEP by primary care providers, and also working to foster its uptake by women at risk of acquiring HIV. We're incorporating PrEP services into outpatient OBGYN clinics at our institution, Women's Hospital. Next slide, please. Two other major issues 
that present ongoing challenges are access to PrEP for individuals who lack any health insurance. And I, I'm sure most of you are aware that Ryan White funds cannot be used for services for those who do not have HIV, as well as distrust of the medical profession in general. The first easy issue was easier to address than the second. Through funds committed to H3 Pittsburgh by foundations, we are able to support costs related to healthcare delivery for uninsured individuals and utilize the Gilead Expanded Access Program for medication, i.e. Truvada or now Descovy. Individuals are referred to a social worker to explore options for healthcare coverage they may not be aware exists or they did not know they were eligible for. Addressing mistrust is an ongoing process and, and frankly journey. We strive to maintain a non-judgmental environment, have a presence at community events to demonstrate support and solidarity within the community. We're always seeking to recruit providers that reflect the communities we serve. Through a SPINS initiative recently completed, we established an HIV track within a family medicine residency training program at a community health center in a medically underserved area. PrEP care is an integral part of their training. Finally, we are partnered with part Project Silk as part of our Part D outreach to youth with HIV. And through other funding, we provide community-based delivery of PrEP using a telehealth platform to individuals who are visiting the Project Silk site. Next slide. Our program committed to implement the Rapid Links to Care initiative, as did all the providers within our collective um, group. It truly does take everyone to do this. To reduce barriers, we, re we established a hotline on a dedicated phone, we call it the BAT phone, that will be answered directly and promptly by a social worker without any phone tree. We put the hotline phone number directly on the HIV antibody results in our electronic medical record. If a patient or referring agency is using the main number for the health system central scheduling, the operators now have an algorithm to send the call for any new HIV patient directly to a nurse coordinator to schedule the appointment for a warm handoff. If the nurse finds there's no available new patient slots within that day or within 24 hours, she seeks physician volunteers to add on a patient outside of their regular clinic schedule. And I have to add, we've always been able to schedule a patient. The schedulers, the social workers, the clinicians, really everyone knows this is a major priority for our program and we have a commitment to implement it. The next slide. Some other challenges encountered with a rapid linkage to care we have found include unnecessary confirmatory viral load testing by primary care physicians, delayed linkage to care and scheduling uh, visits post hospital discharge, denial of HIV status by patient, and comorbidities, including depression and substance use disorder. None of this is news to any of the Ryan White providers. And then finally, um, COVID-19 stay-at-home orders in the spring led to a decline in HIV testing, which is just starting to pick up again. Thus far in 2020, we have seen four truly newly diagnosed patients. Others have been transfers of care. We have seen them all in person uh, throughout the COVID stay-at-home orders. We started them promptly on treatment and they've all returned for follow-up within 30 days. And the takeaway is that it does take commitment from all levels, from the scheduling team to the physicians and good communication with all stakeholders in the community. So in summary, rapid linkage to care requires communication and commitment from everyone, from those not directly involved in your program to every level in your program. Uh, thanks for your attention, and we're happy to respond to any comments or questions uh, you may have. Greetings um, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm here today to talk about ending the epidemic, education and advocacy with city government. And I'm pleased to be joined um, by my colleagues, Dr. Antoine Duehi, 
who is professor of psychiatry and medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, he's the vice chair of the city of Pittsburgh HIV Commission. I serve as the chair of the city of Pittsburgh HIV Commission. And Corey O'Connor, um, who unfortunately cannot be here today, he's councilman for the Pittsburgh City Council District 5. And um, it's because of him that we have the City of Pittsburgh HIV Commission. This is the website for the City of Pittsburgh HIV Commission that lists information about us, who the commissioners are, when our meetings are, and contact information. Um, and you can find additional information and information that we talk about today um, on this website. Corey Connor was key in the founding of the City of Pittsburgh HIV Commission. In fact, it was he um, who put through an ordinance or had or developed the ordinance or created the ordinance with the City of Pittsburgh which was passed in 2012 for the founding of the City of Pittsburgh HIV Commission. And the commission was established to increase communication between service providers serving both consumers at high risk for HIV and AIDS and consumers living with HIV and AIDS. Um, it, it secondly was to establish a collaborative of diverse community, business, academic, and governmental agencies to assess needs, goals, and objectives for effective HIV and STD prevention, education and treatment programs to better protect and serve the citizens of the Pittsburgh region. And finally, uh, to provide policy guidance, recommendation, and consultation to the city's leadership and health community to remove barriers and promote achievements of goals and objectives set forth by the commission. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about the context for the work of the commission. The commission is made up of, of, of a, a maximum of uh, 25 members. Um, but one of the things that we are attempting to do is to work um, in concert with what is happening across the country and ending the epidemic in America. And this involves issues around diagnosis, uh, that is ramping up HIV testing and getting people linked to care so that they can get treated and get access to antiretroviral medication and monitoring and long-term follow-up. Follow Protecting um, by implementing extensive uh, provider training and patient aware awareness and giving people access to pre-exposure prophylaxis, because we know that that is effective in preventing uh, transmission, as well as getting people on effective treatment, because treatment is prevention. If you can lower people's viral load, you can prevent HIV transmission. This has all been proven, as I'm sure you well know, in research studies, both for treatment as prevention and for the efficacy of PrEP. And finally, responding um, to ensure that states and communities have the technologies and personnel resources to investigate all related HIV cases to, top, to, to stop chains of transmission. Um, so this is really important um, when you talk about the intersecting issues of HIV, which are substance use, mental health issues, hepatitis. And Dr. Dewehi is gonna talk about that those intersecting issues in a few moments. On this slide also, uh, you can see, are the goals of the ending the epidemic plan for America to reduce by 75% 75, 75 reduction in new infections in five years, and at least 90% reduction um, over 10 years. So what does that mean on the ground here in Pittsburgh? This is a schematic that the commission developed um, that has the four pillars of ending the epidemic. Diagnosing as early as possible, treating as quickly and as effectively as possible, protecting people at risk, and responding quickly to clusters of new cases. 
And you see here, we have many entities that are very much involved in making this plan real and implementing this plan. So in terms of linking to HIV testing, we have many local community testing sites, street outreach that's happening in Pittsburgh. We have Prevention Point Pittsburgh that's involved in working with uh, individuals who inject drugs. Emergency departments, hospitals, community health centers, primary care providers, drug treatment centers, as well as the Allegheny County Health Department. In terms of treating, we're very lucky in that we have um, two Ryan White Part C clinics here in Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh AIDS Center for Treatment at the University of Pittsburgh, and the Positive Health Clinic at Allegheny Health Network. We also have Allies for Health and Wellbeing, which, which offers um, HIV testing, care and treatment as well. We have Central Outreach, uh, which is another organization that offers treatment um, as well as prevention. And then of course, uh, the community health centers um, within, our, within the, the Pittsburgh area um, and community education about the importance of uh, testing and linkage uh, to care. The other thing that is happening is um, linking uh, individuals to protect, to pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP, and drug and alcohol treatment programs, because both of these types of interventions protect people. So we have freestanding PrEP clinics that are happening in Pittsburgh at the Pittsburgh AIDS Center for Treatment, as well as the Positive Health Clinic, Allies, and then linkage to the existing drug and alcohol treatment programs, which Dr. Dewehi uh, can talk about since he runs, uh, is the head of addiction medicine here at the University of Pittsburgh, as well as um, provider education on effective drug treatment and intervention. And finally, um, the issue of responding quickly to clusters of new cases, uh, working with the Allegheny County Health Department, the Pennsylvania Department of Health, CDC, HRSA, and um, other entities such as uh, the Mid-Atlantic AIDS Education and Training Center. So the priorities that we established um, in 2019 for the commission, um, and we update these every year, um, but is to continue engage sectors outlined in the legislation and diversification that we're supposed to do um, that include healthcare providers, education, and business. So our work is really cross-cutting cross -cutting across, across all sectors, not just healthcare. Um, engagement of expertise um, by members of the commission and others who give us input around the intersecting issues and uh, the co-occurring diseases. Um, collaboration with other city of Pittsburgh programs and stakeholders, and there's several. And the provision of quarterly updates to city council that include identification of city areas of unmet need related to resources, out, outreach, and intervention. And then providing resources to city council, to disseminating to them information to specific communities within the city, expertise uh, that we might be able to offer to develop new policies and programs. And importantly, is maintaining an ongoing dialogue to offer assistance uh, about ongoing and emerging issues. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dewehi, who is Professor of Psychiatry and Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. He's going to talk about the intersecting issues. Dr. Dewehi. Thank you, Dr. Frank. Can I have the next slide, please? So when uh, we have established the mission of the HIV Commission, as Dr. Frank was talking about, you know, and obviously with the ultimate goal, as you know, the aspiration, all the aspiration efforts that we've been seeing to end the HIV epidemic, we have really established, uh, you know, how much it's important to not see HIV as happening in a vacuum. Obviously, as we know, you know, the, the HIV, there is, a, there is a lot of context to you know, how uh, uh, people end up getting infected with HIV. And so there are a lot of intersecting public health issues that we have really uh, uh, really put together here. And 
uh, our really mission also to help, as Dr. Frank was talking about, uh, the help with the policy guidance and also raising awareness and giving recommendations to the city leadership, you know, the, the council about all these issues that have been very much intertwined with the HIV epidemic. So you have really multiple epidemics there that are really interact with each other. And if you look at, obviously there has been, as you know, tremendous uh, uh, advancement, biomedical advancement when it comes to HIV prevention and treatment, you know, and uh, we know very well, if we wanna aim towards ending, you know, the epidemic, there are a lot of issues that have to be addressed you know, and uh, particularly here, as you see, the first one that I want to talk about is really the mental illness. Really, the significant mental illness and a lot of that are also very much tied and connected with substance use uh, uh, problems that we see among people living with HIV. And obviously, people vulnerable to acquiring HIV, we should not really forget that. And obviously, all these problems exacerbate the psychosocial issues, the economic barriers to accessing uh, uh, adequate and sustained healthcare, and they are really obviously the most really challenging among the most challenging barriers to uh, achieving the end of the HIV epidemic. And we know also very well uh, the rates of uh, psychiatric disorders and substance use disorders are really much higher among people, both people vulnerable to acquiring HIV and people living with HIV compared with the general populations. And we know very well also the mental illness, uh, any sort of a psychiatric disorder or mental health impairments, they can definitely uh, uh, increase the risk of acquiring HIV and also is responsible for a lot of the negative health outcomes among people who live with HIV. As you know, most important one is really adhering to treatment and also adhering to the antiretroviral regimen, which is really very crucial. So in every step, in fact, every HIV step, uh, HIV care continuum, you know, the, when uh, mental health issues and substance use issues get in the way, they can basically affect the outcome of the HIV illness. We know very well that we have a lot of really effective tools and treatments that will address really mental uh, health issues as well as substance use issues. The one thing I want to talk about with the intersecting here public health issues when it comes to substance use, obviously the injection drug use is crucial part, you know, it becomes like a more of a, a intersecting epidemic, but also any sort of substance use, because we know very well, it's not just the injection drug use, but it's also the methamphetamine use, cocaine use, any sort of a, a, a substance use that can lead people to engaging in risky behaviors, whether when it comes to acquiring HIV or really basically transmitting HIV to other people. And another thing that is really, as you know, the biggest thing, you know, when it comes to the substance use, it's the opioid use disorder. Opioid use disorder is also tied to the injection drug use. As you know, all these things become very much linked together. And uh, also uh, another one that uh, across, which is the hepatitis, particularly hepatitis C, if you look at more the intersection of HIV, hepatitis C, injection drug use, opioid use, uh, you know, drug use, psychiatric disorders, they become all very much intertwined. And there is definitely high prevalence among, you know, whether people will live with HIV or people are really vulnerable to acquiring HIV. The one thing also I want to really mention here, particularly when it comes to the psychiatric disorders, you know, and substance use, let's not forget also, uh, particularly women living with HIV, you know, with the high rates of IPV, inter intimate partner violence, that can also feed into that, you know, whole epidemic. So we talk about another intersection of another epidemic, you know, within the HIV epidemic. And we know very well one of the things that we have been trying to disseminate a lot, or, you know, in terms of really the policy guidance, everything is that the importance of always uh, uh, responding to all these intersecting epidemics, and you have the STIs there also that I don't want to ignore in a way, is that the response has to be more of a compassionate, scientifically driven and grounded approaches, which what we've been trying obviously to work with all really the, uh, uh, you know, uh, agencies, you know, in terms of making sure, you know, that what's been more and more disseminated and is really the science-based approaches. And uh, 
one aspect here that I want to mention is that uh, as, you, as a result of the socioeconomic issues, you know, we want to talk about, you know, uh, homelessness. This is uh, unstable housing that comes as another intersecting public health issues and poverty that can feed into the HIV, psychiatric disorder, substance use disorders, you know, and obviously, you know, uh, 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 where we talk about the STI and risky behaviors and hepatitis and particularly, as I mentioned, hepatitis C. As you know here, you know, all these kind of pieces have to be really looked at and addressed and understood as really multiple really pieces of the puzzle, except instead of really just seeing the HIV happening in a vacuum. Next slide, please. So the, the commission has really brainstormed over the course of really years you know, in a sense, and all these discussions we've had uh, by meeting regularly is discussing how can we really disseminate also to the public, to the general public, as well as obviously the city's leadership, you know, the city council, you know, the, uh, uh, what we know in terms of a science-based and uh, information. Uh, and uh, we came up with the idea of what we call briefs. In fact, Dr. Frank was really, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, brought up, you know, that whole idea, how about if we can put together, you know, that briefs that are really provide that sort of uh, latest scientific information, best practices, evidence-based practices, resource considerations, and ultimately, as we know, our major role is with the policy guidance and considerations. So we came up with different kind of topics, you know, in terms of the briefs, you know, and we've, we've already uh, put together a few of them, and we are working on uh, uh, another really bunch of them here. And the ones that are under development are the one on PrEP, aging, adolescence, and the cultural humility. Some of the examples I'm gonna talk about here briefly. So for example, the first one we've worked on, which is the HIV and substance use disorder. As you know, how we designed the briefs that are really posted on the website, on the commission website. And so obviously people can have access to them and, uh, uh, you know, and really get uh, the, some of the references there too. But the way we've designed them is to put it together as there is the background, we talk about the issue, for example, the intersecting, you know, HIV and substance use disorders epidemics. We talk about interventions that are the science-based interventions. As you can see a lot of bullet points here, which is really easy to read, easy to, to really kind of process and digest. And we have the recommendations there in terms of 3D policies, as well as, you know, uh, 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 dissemination to really the public. And this, for example, I'm not going to be able to read the whole thing here, but just to give you an idea about the HIV and substance use disorders, most importantly, we talk about the importance of the routine testing for HIV and drug and alcohol program, as well as screening for substance use in HIV programs, like Dr. Frank was mentioning about the importance of obviously looking at it from all aspects of the uh, you know, the uh, uh, HIV care continuum, and also talking about really the importance of the integrated approach when we are working with patients uh, uh, with who, living with HIV and have multiple medical, psychiatric, and substance use issues that to always provide an integrated care approach, you know, uh, really the best ideal approach would be to uh, provide care in, uh, in one setting, but obviously if it is not possible, really to make sure that whatever that care that's provided in two different or three different settings to be really well coordinated and well integrated. And as we can refer always to the importance, as we know, the connection with the opioid use disorder, I, I can't emphasize enough about that because of the, of the overdose education, you know, and the use of naloxone and distribution of naloxone and, you know, in HIV treatment programs, as well as in drug and alcohol treatment program in psychiatric settings. And, uh, and this is really crucial because as we know, we've talked earlier about the uh, intersections of the, the epidemics of opioid use disorder, as well as HIV and uh, psychiatric disorders and HCV. We have the recommendations there that you can see for evidence-based recommendations that will obviously uh, uh, support and recommend different things to do uh, whether education and harm reduction approaches, also pharmacological treatment, as well as psychosocial treatments, as well as also involving concerned significant others and family members in the treatment. Next one, please. So this one is on the psychiatry, mental health and HIV. The same design as I've uh, discussed with the substance use disorders, the background there, 
you know, really what the problem is, what the, the extent of the problem. And as you know, uh, uh, it is again, another intersecting problem with the psychiatric disorders, you know, and there is a high prevalence of really what we call the triple diagnosis that we see whether in HIV settings or in psychiatric or drug and alcohol treatment settings, which is really the HIV, mental illness, as well as substance use disorders. We talk about basically the interventions I mentioned, you know, how much it is really to also look at the integrated and the trauma informed treatment, because again, uh, I talked about the IPV as a big issue with particularly in women living with HIV, but also we're talking about a lot of really uh, traumatic experiences that uh, patients who have, who live with HIV experience. And we have to always screen, you know, for any kind of a trauma, uh, traumatic experiences and address them as a part of a trauma-informed approach, which definitely can improve the clinical outcomes. And the considerations that we gave for the Pittsburgh City Council, as we said, the city's leadership, they are on the right side here of the, of the brief, is also to really uh, re-emphasize the importance also of developing and supporting and expanding programs that will increase the mental health workforce. And as I mentioned, a lot of the initiatives that would integrate HIV, psychiatric care, substance use, as well as doing it in a very much of a trauma-informed approach. Next one, please. This is the uh, STDs, you know, STIs, you know, and hepatitis C. I've already talked about, uh, you know, the importance of looking at how also HCV has been very much co-occurring with HIV. You know, you're talking about, uh, but whether particularly in the context of really substance use disorders or, or non-substance use disorder, but particularly in the context of IV drug use, you know, uh, injection drug use, you know, that you see the high prevalence of HIV with HCV. And this kind of creates a, a kind of a clinical dilemmas because in terms of making sure that patients are actively involved treatment for the HIV, so they can also receive eventually the treatment, as you know, the newer treatment with the direct antiviral therapies, and that work really very well in terms of really curing the hep C. And, uh, but most importantly, as we know, if patients are not involved in treatment for their substance use disorder, psychiatric disorder, they are not really in a, a, a good place to be able to start these treatments. And they, you know, obviously we cannot initiate that. And one of the big issues is that we have been advocating for, as you know, is the increasing advocacy for people engaging in HIV and as well treatment as well as hep C treatment. And, uh, and most importantly, as we know, the marginalized populations that uh, really have very ton of obstacles and barriers to get engaged in, uh, in treatment, you know, and so we want to look at these issues. And obviously, ultimately, we want to make sure that we're going to have advocate, you know, uh, uh, on the behalf of the of the state and the government to make uh, to have access to generic medications. And basically, obviously, we know a lot of these medications are expensive when it comes to the treatment of the HCV, you know, so we want to make sure people are going to be able to have access to them. And this is what we've been advocating and looking at uh, recommending, you know, for the city, for the Pittsburgh City Council. Next one, please. I'll finish. I think it's, this is the last one that we have, which is really the focus on women, you know, and HIV. And this requires really very specific, you know, brief as we thought about. And uh, particularly we address, as I mentioned earlier, the intimate partner violence. We, we talk about the special issues that women living with HIV or women who are vulnerable for acquiring HIV really are uh, uh, dealing with, you know, and uh, this is a huge one for us that we have worked very hard on because we know how much it is really also important to look at particularly the, uh, 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 and we're talking about really issues related, you know, uh, to gender identity. And this is something that we will address in a subsequent brief separately. But again, we need to really always keep in mind that, uh, you know, the biggest really challenge when it comes to also the, the racial and societal inequalities and uh, access to care and, uh, uh, you know, healthcare, economic inequalities and all these aspects that can definitely affect, you know, a uh, 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 woman's health, you know, women living with HIV, whether engagement in treatment or staying in treatment and retaining them in treatment. And obviously making sure that we advocate on behalf of uh, women living with HIV and particularly, you know, as we've talked about with the city council, 
you know, in terms of providing services, providing uh, uh, resources, you know, in the community as well as, you know, uh, 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 you know, addressing barriers that can get in the way of a woman living with HIV and getting into treatment or women who are vulnerable, you know, to HIV, to acquiring HIV, when we're talking about really, uh, engage, you know, uh, women at risk, you know, and, and particularly, as I mentioned, you know, that supporting a lot of really, whether certain exchange programs, whether supporting, you know, the uh, um, education provision of uh, naloxone for women living with HIV and substance use. And also, as I mentioned, the IPV is, which is very crucial in providing resources for them regarding that problem. Next one, I think that's my last one. And now uh, Dr. Frank, you know, is gonna talk about the community outreach piece. Thank you, Dr. Dewehi. Um, one of the things that I have been thinking about and one of the things that I do as the chair of the City of Pittsburgh HIV Commission, we, and I, I try to be a catalyst for developing these briefs and this information that's really targeted and easily accessible to people that are running city government um, and making it available to them, not just by posting on our website, but Dr. Duwehi and I uh, regularly go and meet with city council and do a presentation on what's happening now. And this is very important um, to keep city council up to date on what's going on from our perspective as uh, the city of Pittsburgh HIV Commission. The other thing that we try to do, and we've done through some of the briefs that we've already completed, as well as the ones that we're continuing to work on, is we want to um, talk about the emerging issues. And what are the new things that we're seeing? What are the new challenges? What are the new opportunities for us to offer recommendations um, to the City of Pittsburgh City Council? Because we, we can only offer recommendations um, and that's what we do. For example, one of the things that we're dealing with now is COVID-19 across the country, around the world. So there may be an opportunity for us uh, to provide input to the city council on this new intersecting issue with all the other things that we've been talking about. So how do you take care of people that, all, that have HIV and also have you know, been exposed to COVID-19? So that would be an example of something that we might add to you know, our, our work going forward in the near future. But one of the things that happened when we met uh, with the city council and with um, Councilman uh, O'Connor was that we decided we wanted to do a bit more in terms of community outreach. And the question was, how could we do that? Um, because we're really not the doers of intervention in the community, um, we're policy folks. And so what we thought about doing and what we've done um, is developing a series of posters that are, are going to be disseminated throughout the Pittsburgh community um, by the City of Pittsburgh HIV Commission. Um, and uh, Councilman O'Connor has agreed um, that um, they'll make resources available for this to happen. Um, so the first one we did was <clears throat> one related to engaging in HIV treatment. Um, and you can see here the, the little, um, um, uh, it's not really a schematic, but the design um, sort of looks like um, the design for um, one, of our, one of our sports teams, but it's really not exactly the same. Um, and we thought that, that this could be um, a way to attract people to looking at this. And we wanted these things to be very simple and very direct with not uh, tons of information. Um, information about why it's important and where to go um, if you um, wanna get treatment. Um, this, was, this one was about getting HIV tested. So this is another one that we did. Um, uh, Pittsburghers doing it 
Um, we do it together because we're building a solid foundation for our future. And then the most recent one that we've been working on is one about PrEP. Um, my doctor and I decided PrEP was right for me. And it explains what it is and you know where to go if you want information about it. So we anticipate that we're gonna be doing more of these. And the other thing that we have talked about on the City of Pittsburgh HIV Commission is to making ourselves available um, for um, community events uh, to disseminate this information, not exactly, not really doing the intervention itself, but making people aware of what resources are available for testing, treatment, prep, and linkage to care. Um, and so this is why we've done, uh, we've done the posters. So with that, um, that is our presentation. And I encourage you to please go to the website for the City of Pittsburgh HIV Commission, where all, all of the information that we have presented today is posted and is available. You can actually download it and look at it. And I encourage you to continue to um, go back to the website as we continue to develop new briefs and new information for the Pittsburgh City Council. Um, I want to personally thank Councilman Corey O'Connor um, for his initiation of the City of Pittsburgh HIV Commission. Uh, we do believe that is a very important commission uh, for any city, city. And I wonder, Dr. Dewey, if you wanted to make any comment about, uh, from your vantage point, the importance of the City of Pittsburgh HIV Commission. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Frank. Thank you so much also for your leadership. You know, I mean, I, I, I believe working with you and the, uh, you know, commission member has been a, a very rewarding experience. I think it's, I look at it as great service for the city. And, uh, and uh, obviously, I strongly believe that we need to always remember that we don't want to forget, obviously, unfortunately, with all the issues that have been happening, there has been a tendency to really forget much about the epidemic, still the epidemic of HIV and all these intersecting problems. I think the fact that we are really still actively involved in this advocacy piece and the, as you mentioned, you talked about the community outreach, which is really very crucial because also in addition to what Dr. Frank was talking about in terms of what we need to do for the communities, we've been also meeting with a lot of agencies in the community who have been providing the interventions, who are the doers in a sense, you know, to really kind of uh, make sure that we're collaborating more with them and we really have a more of a, of a really presence also, you know, and in the communities, you know, and so they would know also what sort of work we're doing. So it's, it's been a great experience. And I think that we still have a lot of work to do, you know, to end the epidemic, you know, and uh, so, uh, uh, so that's it for me. And we hope that <clears throat> you'll go to, to, to the website, but pl please feel free to contact us. Um, we know that there's some other models around the country for uh, city commissions, uh, but if you'd like to know more about it, and uh, you know, perhaps there's other people around the country that uh, would like to develop a, a, a commission for their city, we'd be happy to help you. So um, thank you so much um, for your participation. And um, Goodbye from Pittsburgh. Thank you.